to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it. We have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. Today's guest is a true inspiration, McCall Dolkus, founder and principal designer of Interiors by McCall. She has been through quite the journey to get where she is today, not just in business, but in life as well. With her college sweetheart, NBA player, and now NBA coach, they had three kids in 22 months. During this period, they moved from country to country. (laughs) And, you know, the pandemic hit on top of it. The number of things that she had to rise above is remarkable. And I can't wait for her to share her story with you today. You will hear me say more than once the word resilience. And it really applies to McCall. She is now internationally known for her innovative and modern approach to interiors as well as living spaces. And I think you're going to really be captured by her story. Before we hear about McCall's story, though, you know that the registration for Luann Live 2023 is open. Yes, it is. Go to LuannLive.com. Health and wealth, a well-designed business within a well-designed life. You don't want to miss this, okay? If you were at either of the others, 2019 in person or 2021 live, I mean, um, that one was virtual. You know what I'm talking about. You already know what I'm talking about. And I would love for you to experience it for yourself if you've only ever heard about it. Um, it is like any other conference in the industry. Um, we travel as a group throughout the day. What does that mean? That means we have our meals together. We hang out together. Um, This is not a kind of a conference where, oh, you know, check out and go to Orlando and go sightseeing for a few hours. No, no, no. This is all of us together. And so I also encourage you that if you don't have a designer bestie yet, if you don't really have anybody in the industry and you get a little concerned that you come into a conference like this and think, you know, what am I going to do? I'm telling you, you're going to be with me. You're going to be with us. It is unlike any experience ever. Please come because this is where you're going to meet your designer bestie if you don't have one. We've had dozens of shows of designers telling us how they met each other at this event. I was just talking with Katie Menon, Jenny Slingerlin, and uh, Candy Scott, three designers, Canada, Chicago, and Arizona that met at Luann Live 2019 and remain friends, weekly conversations. Okay. This is not like anything you've experienced. I don't say it lightly and I'm not exaggerating. Go to LuannLive.com and get your ticket. All right. I'm ready to introduce you to McCall. Hey, McCall, thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hi, Luann. Thank you so much. This is such a full circle moment for me, so I'm I'm honored to be here with you. <laughs> well, I have to say, I, I, I read your intake form, and first of all, my first thought was, holy cow, what resilience this young woman has exhibited over the last five or six years. And I just thought to myself, I could probably actually just read your intake form and the entire audience would be like, okay, that was insane. And we actually don't need an interview. <laughs> like it's just remarkable what you've been through. Thanks. Yeah. It is, it's been crazy. I've had kind of a, a crazy journey to get here today. It's, it's pretty unbelievable. So I'm really excited to be on the show and tell you guys a little bit about um, just how I got here and and with my personal life and how it's affected my business because they've really gone hand in hand over the years. 
Yeah, and I do always ask the guests if they could name their show, what would they name it? And yours was, you know, to the effect of how to do, how to establish an de- interior design business from all over the world. And that's really the, the, the what we're talking about here is not only, um, you know, the number of places and the number of times you've moved in such a short period of time, but also adding to it, having given birth uh, to a set of twins and a baby all under three years. I mean, is it under two years it was? Uh, yeah, they were un- under in 22 months, three, oh three kids God. in 22 months. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's, it's, that's beyond. And then also you shared in your intake form that you also had postpartum depression on top of it. And, you know, going through and, you know, watching my daughter's journey with that, I can't even fathom it. So tell me, McCall, where do we want to start with all of, we're just teasing all of this stuff out, but let's, where do you want to start with it? I think I'll give you guys just kind of a rundown of my story and how I've got here because it it does go so hand in hand with my business and the business model that I've created. So I'll kind of start from the beginning and just walk you through, you know, how, how I got here today. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so yeah, my, my husband and I were college sweethearts. Um, and we actually spent the first 10 years of our marriage living in seven different countries across (laughs) Europe. So we would move every year, uh, depending on where he would sign his professional basketball contract. He was, he's a professional basketball player. Um, and yeah, it took us around, around the world. So I was raised in an extremely academic household And my parents really prioritized going to college, maintaining a perfect GPA, getting a postgraduate degree, you know, and having one of those white collar jobs, an attorney, a doctor, an engineer. And even though I always did really well in school, my brain was definitely more, you know, left leaning, more creative. I loved anything that required creativity and the arts. I was really into theater, um, but my parents always pushed me into following what they believed would be a more stable career path. Um, and in their defense, I think back then it was so much more difficult to make a good living with a creative job. And mm-hmm. nowadays, um, you know, with the internet and social media, if you have a skill set, it's entirely possible to monetize it, no matter what that might be. But I, it, that wasn't always the case. So I do... Um, you know, give them a pass for that. I would tell them, I want to be an actress. And they'd say, well, that's a hobby, (laughs) but what do you want to do for work? You know, you'll you'll go to college, you'll get a degree, you'll you'll go to postgraduate school, like you can be an actress for fun, but that's not going to be your career. Yeah, we'll come Um, see you in Oklahoma. Yeah, (laughs) it's not going to happen. So uh, yeah, I was like, okay, I'll I'll be an attorney. You know, everyone in my family is an attorney. (laughs) Sure. I, I like to argue. I'm a good debater. I'll I'll go to school and I'll be an attorney. Um, So I went to Florida State. I got a full academic scholarship and I double majored in political science and social science and economics. Um, (laughs) And I was going to go to law school after that. That was going to be, you know, it was in the cards for me. And I got there and, you know, life happened. I met my husband, um, who was my boyfriend there at the time. He had come over from Lithuania to play professional basketball or to play college basketball at Florida State. And um, we met and he wanted me to move overseas with him when we graduated. So I'm sure my parents were absolutely thrilled that after, you know, my full academic scholarship and graduating cum laude, (laughs) that I wasn't going to worry about my career. I was going to go follow my fiance and watch him play basketball overseas. So they're like, wait, you could be an actress. (laughs) Yeah, right. We changed our mind. Come back. We'll take that. We'll take that. Don't follow somebody around the world. (laughs) Right. So I'm sure they were absolutely thrilled. Um, about that decision, but that's what I did. And, um, you know, it ended up molding, molding my life. And the time that I spent in Europe is where I grew my love for design. Um, Mm. so the first, you know, I think our third or fourth year overseas, we bought an investment property, um, in a, the historic old town of Vilnius in Lithuania, where my husband's from. And we renovated the entire interior and furnished it um, and started to rent it out short term. So I would 
post pictures, you know, on social media and get um, messages from friends and family like, oh, my God, I, I love your place. Can you help me with my place? And that's kind of, you know, how it was born. Eventually, they started um, referring me out to their inner circles, and it all kind of um, took off from there. But really, looking back, I think so much of my admiration and appreciation for interior design really just sprouted from those years in Europe. Um, I would spend my days, you know, wandering museums. When we lived in Venice, uh, my husband would be out of town for an away game, and I would take the train um, into Venice and walk through the Academia Museum or the Guggenheim and when we were in Istanbul, I grew an obsession with textiles, and I'd spend a ton of time in these incredible bazaars that sold the Turkish rugs and just the most gorgeous uh, fabrics you've ever seen. So eventually, I just grew such a cognizance for art and for design that um, I was able to live this life where I could, you know, just hop on a train and be hours from some of the most historically relevant sites in the world and being able to see all those things gave me a really comprehensive view of all aspects of architecture and design and, you know, its evolution over time. And that's really what initially planted the seed for me. Um, I, that's incredible. What an incredible like yeah. lifestyle there, right? You know, I'm just thinking about what you're saying is, you know, I'm sure you had amazing, amazing experiences with him there, but we all dream of that. Like, yes, I have a weekend by myself, go anywhere, do anything. And that means I can get on a train and be in Venice, like stop right. <laughs> or, or Istanbul or something like that. That's crazy. Yeah, it, it was great. And looking back, it, it's definitely what, what started everything for me. And I didn't know it at the time. I was kind of just being a sponge and soaking it all in. But when I look back to those moments, that is absolutely what made me grow, you know, such an appreciation for design and different cultures and their different architecture and just watching how it's evolved by country, um, you know, by, by the times. It, it was really fascinating to me. What were the seven countries that you spent time living in? We were in Lithuania, Latvia, three different cities in Turkey, two different cities in Spain, Poland. Um, am I forgetting any? And then the States. I wow. One, it. two, three, yeah. four, five. That's crazy. That's crazy. And what I love is about it is they are not all the same. Right. Oh, yeah. When right. we talk about like we've had a lot of conversations on the podcast over the last couple of years about how design is rooted so often what's get what gets, um, you know, uh, advertised, marketed or whatever is interior design that's rooted in Euro white centric right. design. Yep. Right. And so you are spending place time in a variety of places and getting exposed to, you know, all different cultures of design. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, you know, in, in Turkey, Turkey is such a beautiful place with such a deep, deep history and design. And even today, you know, so many designers import things from Turkey, whether it's the rugs or the textiles. So that gave me, you know, I was able to see the whole rug making process and just mm. get, you know, such a, a back end look at how all of these things have been made and how over time their the rug making process has changed, what stayed the same. So I think all of that is, um, you know, and, and having different experiences, like you said, so much of design, people look to France, they look to Italy, but I think having, you know, this wide variety of um, countries that I've lived in that I was able to take a little bit with me from each of those, I'll never be one of those designers that only, you know, gravitates to one style. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with designers that have found their style and that's what they go to. I, I think that's great. But just for me personally, from having this experience with the different countries and, you know, everything that they have to offer, I'll never be the type of designer that can give one look or that specializes in one thing just because I have such an appreciation for so many, you know, different styles. 
Well, it makes perfect sense when you when you think about how it's you know when you talk about the exposure you, that you've had. You're not talking about a weekend trip to Turkey, <laughs> like right. You're talking about actually soaking up the culture of these different countries and spending time, and it becomes part of your DNA. I would almost think of like your design DNA is what I should say, right? It's just it's not like you're just going to forget the beautiful things. And I, I I agree with you. I could see how it would influence everything. And for your clients that you work with, you know, to come and understand that it's not a one size fit all. And you're right. There's, we look, there are super ridiculously successful designers that have established a look. It's their look. It brings them joy. Their clients get joy from it. I'm with you, McCall, you know, hands up, high five to anybody who wants to do it. But for someone like yourself, I don't even see how it could probably be even possible to do that at this point. You're too aware, right? Right. It's just, it's more fulfilling for me to be able to kind of dip my toes into to different styles. And that's not to say I do everything. There's certain styles, you know, that just don't really align with, with you know, my aesthetic. So it, it's not to say I'll do absolutely anything. Like I'm, I'm not really a farmhouse girl, you know, there's styles that might not be so much me, but I love to dip my toes in, in different things and kind of, I think my clients come for me or come to me and hire me for my history and for my story. And I think it's important to them um, that I do bring this knowledge of these different cultures and places that I've lived in in hiring me, that's what they get. And I, I sit down with them and see, you know, what they're looking for, but also how can I use my experiences, the places that I've lived to, you know, give them the look that they're going for, but really make it something unique as well. Right. Well, I mean, and you know, you've, you've mentioned both in your intake form and our conversation before that you listen to the show. And so the, the point is when you listen to the show, you know, exactly that is your Fred Burns only your Jude Charles story, right? It's right. like, what is it about me that is different and unique? That is my only. And that is exactly that, that broad experience across cultures and design styles that has now become part of your um, aesthetic and a part of your who you show up every day as, and of course that's that's exactly the secret sauce in the statement that you said that your clients come to you for your history for your story. Um, you know that from the show, right, McCall? Right. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard you say that. Um, I've heard so many guests on your show say that, and yeah, that's definitely what makes me unique is my history and my story, and and that's kind of what I've run with. Yeah. Now. Let's transition. Let's tell a little bit about the personal side of what's happening during this time, because I think it's that's where I started the show talking about your resilience. It's beyond incredible. And then that's going to lead us into how you launched the design business, you know, more formally than a couple of friends saying, hey, great work at the apartment. Let me do something for right. you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, we were, I think we were in Spain for the for our first, um, our first round in Spain, this was maybe our fourth or fifth year overseas. And I had, you know, started helping some friends and family at home. And I just kind of always knew I wanted so much more for myself than to just be a basketball wife. Um, and I thought about how could I translate this love for interiors that I picked up into a business? Uh, and even more so one that could be done successfully, no matter where I lived. That was kind of the kicker. That what I needed to figure out. Um, so Interiors by McCall was officially born in January of 2018. I was living in Santiago de Compostela, Spain, and I would start doing e-design. So I would charge like next to nothing, um, you know, to <laughs> virtually design some spaces uh, for clients back in the States just to get some experience, to build up my portfolio and then um, we'd be in South Florida in Palm Beach County uh, during the off season over the summer. And I would begin to take some in-person clients there and the business kind of slowly grew from there. Um, the following year, my husband signed a contract in Istanbul in Turkey and I had planned to deliver our first child there. I was pregnant 
And at about eight months pregnant, he tore his ACL in a traumatic injury. So we returned home to Florida. Um, I was eight months pregnant and we ended up delivering her in Florida where I was from. So for the first time in years, we kind of found ourselves in the States for an extended period of time as he rehabbed. I think we were there like eight or nine months, which was crazy <laughs> for us. Um, so my list of clients. That you're saying like a really long time. Eight really months, stable, right? really stable. <laughs> eight, nine months in one place. It was unbelievable. Um, but yeah, kind of being there for that time, even though I had this newborn, he was home and I was like, wow, this yeah. is great. Like having him at home right now. So my list of clients kind of slowly began to grow while I was, you know, staying in the States for a little bit. Um, when he ended up healing from that injury, he played in Poland that following year. So I went over to Poland with him. My daughter was then, you know, 13 months old. I now looking back realized I was having postpartum depression, mm-hmm. anxiety, and I, I was never diagnosed with that. That was something that I just felt like that was, you know, what happened. You had this baby and it it can be so paralyzing that life change and just how completely upside down your world is turned. And, and I just thought like, oh, this is normal the way that I feel because, you know, my life is so different. I'm, you know, starting the second chapter. It's totally normal that I feel like this. And Mm -hmm. then kind of after several months when I, and I was lucky to be able to get out of that place. Um, you know, but some people aren't. But when I came out of that, I was like, oh my God, that was not normal. Like, right. You see the difference. You see the difference. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, I cannot believe I thought. And I mean, in defense of all my friends and family, like I wasn't talking to anyone about any of this. Like, I just thought this is tough, but you know, I've, I've had a ton of adversity in my life and I've always just been one to kind of power through it. And I think now I know that's not necessarily, you know, the way to go about things, but I've just always kind of been in that survivor mentality that that is what I I just felt like everything was normal and push through and you'll get through this and you'll get over it. And um, that's what I did. That's not what I recommend for anyone listening. If you feel like, wow, I, you know, I I wonder if this is normal, like go talk to someone, go see someone. Mm -hmm. But I, I did not know that when I was in, you know, the thick of it. So I had this 13 month old in Poland. I'm, you know, battling this postpartum, trying to figure out, you know, this extremely foreign concept of being a mother with a business that's starting to take off um, and living in a country with no family around. So I had all these things going on. And then I would be shocked with the biggest shock of my lifetime. um, And that's that I was pregnant with twins. So that that was um, that was tough. I was already like, you know, growing up, I kind of had a little bit of perfectionism where, um, you know, things typically came fairly easy to me. And if they didn't, I would just work really hard at them and until they became easy to me. And motherhood is not one of those things that you can mm-hmm. just, um, you know, automatically per- be perfect at. And I struggled so much with, wow, why is this, you know, so difficult for me? And I really struggled with um, just just how, how hard it was and that I couldn't, there was no manual I could open, nothing I could read or do to just master it. And that was a tough, tough concept for me. So I think God was like, oh, you think like you're not equipped to be a mother? Like, let me show you how equipped you can be. And then it was like, Here's your twins. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. So we were, I think it was about eight months into my twin pregnancy. We moved back to Spain to a new city um, right outside of Barcelona. I delivered my twins in a Spanish hospital outside of Barcelona where I couldn't even communicate with my team of nurses and doctors. Like literally no one in there spoke English. Um Whoa. And I spent the next, you know, several months in just this state of shock of how would I possibly survive life with three children under two years old. Um, And my business became the one aspect of my life that I felt like I had control over. You know, it was something that gave me an identity outside of my children and outside of my husband and his job and his, you know, nomadic life that had really dictated our life for so many years, I finally could control one thing about my life. And that was my business. Um, So yeah, the insanity of three kids under two in a foreign country with my husband always on the road wasn't enough. 
in comes March 2020. And yeah, here's a global pandemic for you. Let's let's see how this works out. Um, so Spain was the, the, um, the third country outside of China and Italy to really be hit with COVID. So I remember we were months ahead of the U.S. in all of this. Um, we were sent into a severe lockdown. So for 44 days, my kids weren't allowed outside of our apartment. There was no going for walks, nothing. I mean, we were on such a strict lockdown. They would let one parent go to the store once a day. And I mean, there were police patrolling the streets where they would ask to see your receipt to make sure you went to the store. It wow. was, yeah, it was insane. And so, yeah, my, we had our four month old twins and my daughter was two at this point and we were stuck inside for 44 days. Um, oh my goodness. So even though it was such a, you know, scary time of such uncertainty, the, the silver lining of the whole situation was that for the first time since I'd had kids, I had my husband home and I had, mm. I got to experience, you know, having a partner and, someone else to help me um, take care of these kids uh, because his, you know, basketball season was paused and then abruptly cut short. So that was the silver lining is he got to be there um, for a lot of those, those moments in the beginning. Um, But yeah, like all the other designers. Sure. No, that but that is interesting because first of all, just thinking about that pre that. So the kids are the twins are four months old. So you had four months where theoretically three different children could be getting up during the middle of the night. Two are definitely getting up off and on oh, yeah. during the middle of the night. And a two year old is still getting up in the middle of the night randomly. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Especially if one of the twins wakes up and cries and wakes up the two year old, right? But I mean, the you must have gone like, and, and it's not like your mom is around, you've got girlfriends around, you've got, you know, cu- sisters, cousins, brothers, and he's also traveling. Right. That is right there, just beyond my comprehension, fr- frankly. Like, it's absolutely beyond my comprehension. But then it's odd that such a terrifying place because. You know, at least here for us in New Jersey, I'm not going to speak even for the entire U.S., right? But I know that we were on lockdown, but we were out on our, it was like you didn't go on as many walks or bike rides and you did in the first month of lockdown. You know, you were out doing things and, you know, it, it was different. We weren't meeting our friends and family for things, but I mean, Vin and I, every single day, we would get up, do our work remotely, and at like three o'clock, we'd be like, want to go for a walk? Let's go for a walk. And we did an hour walk, then come back and do more work. But to know that you're not allowed out. And then also, you do have three little babies that are vulnerable. And we didn't know what was going on then, what was happening. So even, okay, it is your time to go out and take your turn to the store with a country that is so severely locked down. It probably was terrifying to even do that, afraid that you would bring it back to the babies. Oh, it was, yeah, it was terrifying. And when I think back to those moments, people always ask me like, oh my God, how did you survive? And I'm like, I swear to you, I think I've blacked out like several yeah. months of like the newborn life with them. I have no, I just remember, you know, my husband would be gone and this was even pre COVID. I would have the twins that would like only sleep on me. And then I hear my daughter waking up in the middle oh. of the night. I'm trying to like get them off of me so I can go check on my daughter. But no yeah, way. I think I've blacked no out a lot of that period no of just That's like weird. when you're in that survival mode and you you honestly just black it out because yeah, you just yeah. did what you had to do in that moment to get through yeah. it and then afterwards you're like wow how how did I do that that's what I'm saying. When I read your thing, I was just like the resilience of this young woman is beyond my comprehension. And so the thing is now the crazy fear of the intense lockdown of what's happening in Spain, though, does come with this silver lining of your husband being home, right? And so now maybe you can actually, I don't know, go to the bathroom and maybe feed yourself and take a 20 second nap, right? Like, but also him, he gets this gift of being able to be with the three babies for this extended period of time, which he had never had with the first daughter, right? Right, right. Yeah, it was definitely the silver lining. And I mean, of all the horrific things that COVID brought, you know, the deaths and the economic repercussions, the people missing out on moments and memories. I mean, there were so many awful 
things about it, mm-hmm. of course. But for us, there was that little sliver of, wow, mm-hmm. like we get to kind of feel what life would be like, you know, really as a family of five, like with <laughs> us. So I also think that's important for my husband to have been there in those early months. Now mm-hmm. he has a lot more respect for what I go through on a daily basis. <laughs> Not like he didn't before, but sometimes you have no, to see different. it every day to feel it's that, you know? Different. Yeah. No, it's different. It's like, oh, that looks hard. Or, oh, I changed that diaper. That was a pain. Oh, no. We're not. We're talking about sleep and food deprivation, right? Yep. Like right. functioning on fumes, you know? Um, so amazing. All right. So now... You come through this and eventually, you know, what, what was interesting is that in the height of this, you describe that the business felt like the one thing that you could control. I'm amazed that you even had the energy to develop a brain cell towards working on the business, but just recognizing that you're not a normal human, McCall, that's just what (laughs) I'm going to just say out there. Okay. But this is what you do now. So I guess the combination with him being at home and the, the help that you're getting, and you're now focusing on building the business. So take us down that road now. Sure. I think like so many of the other designers that have been on your podcast, COVID was also a time of extreme and rapid growth um, for my company. So these new inquiries were pouring in by the day because everyone was just stuck sitting around their home, picking apart everything they hated about it. Um, So yeah, my business really took off and I would soon realize that I needed some help. Um, And I'll talk about this a lot today, but there is so many different ways to run your business. And it's so easy to get caught up in feeling the need to run your business in one way that you've read about, seen, it worked for this person, so this is what I should do. And what's so important is for you to sit down and make a business model that works for you. I'm not Mm. someone that wanted to be managing a big team of people. I realized that I needed help and I needed boots on the ground um, in South Florida where my all my clients were. So I ended up hiring, um, you know, a few contract workers that I have doing part time work for me in, um, in and around the South Florida area where the majority of my clients are. Uh, so they'd be there for in person visits, uh, but the back end of my site was really ran similarly to my e-design, my virtual business, where the grunt of my work was still done virtually, but I had, you know, built up this team who could be there for field measuring, appointments, meeting with trades, site visits, things like that. Um, So I eventually transitioned away from the concept of e-design to now offer, you know, full service interior design services you know, with everything being managed in South Florida, but I was really in my little COVID headquarters outside of Barcelona in Spain. (laughs) That's remarkable. (laughs) Yeah. And I think a lot of that is I I was able to get really lucky and find some people that I trust. um, And that could represent my business without me being there. But so here's the thing. Like I I just, yeah. So first of all, you have never worked for an interior design firm. Right. You don't have any education in interior design. Not that, you know, look, Nate Burkus never went to school for interior design. That's not a criteria. But the simple fact is, is that, you know, that's one thing when you're showing up every day, Monday to Friday, and having the, f- the firsthand conversation with the contractor, with the painter, with the window treatment person, blah, blah, blah. But here you are in Spain, a different time zone. You don't have a process for running a firm because there's you've not done it before. You know, two things I want to say. I want to say, how did you develop a process to do this virtually when it's, it's I, I listen, McCall. I've interviewed 900 interior designers, and I can tell you what I know for a fact is it is not easy to develop your own process for running a project. It's just not. If it was, I wouldn't have a podcast, okay? So, A, how did you do this without the experience of working for other people, let alone do it remotely? And number two, now I'm sort of sort of thought going back to where was the influence of all of that academic structure that your parents <laughs> insisted on, right? Like it's got to be coming coming in somewhere, even just how to think like a business person, how to think like a lawyer from those, you know, the political science majors and all of that other stuff. Is that, is, did that impact and influence you? Absolutely. And that is, you're exactly right there. That is where it came from is, 
you know, even though I'm running this creative, uh, I'm running with a creative job here, I'm still have that academic inside of me. I'm still a learner and I'm always Mm -hmm. learning. And there's so many resources out there for designers, um, free, paid, basically anyone you've had on your show as a guest that offers a service, I've hired them. Like I have hired every (laughs) single person that's been on your show. I um, I hired Katie McFarlane of Dakota Design Company to do my processes. So again, so much of that is trial and error. And I tried to set up processes and I had already had, you know, somewhat of a process for my e-design clients, but I hired Katie and um, she really helped me fine tune my business so that my clients were getting that luxury experience. Mm. Um, And any project to this day that has ever gotten off track, I can 100% of the time trace back to letting the client dictate my process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's difficult in a service-based industry to feel like you always need to please the client. So when they come to you and say, well, what if we did things like this? You inside, you want to tell them, yeah, sure, we can do that. I can work with you. You want to be flexible. You know, these luxury clients are used to having people bend over backwards for them. And I think it's such a fine line of wanting, you know, to feel like you can be a team player, but also saying, look, I've developed this process and I did so because I know we need to follow it in order for your project um, to be successful. But That's a really tough line um, in in feeling like you are satisfying your client and being flexible for them. A lot of these, a lot of my clients um, nowadays are are professional athletes just based on, um, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of the, uh, my network of people. Mm -hmm. So these are people who are extremely busy and they're so used to just having people quite frankly, do whatever to work with them. They will change (laughs) anything. And it's tough to want to be flexible for them, but also say, look, I've I've developed this process because I know this is what we need to follow um, in order for your project to be successful. So walking that line is is difficult. But yeah, Katie McFarlane with Dakota Design Company was probably some of the best money I've ever spent. She really helped me um, develop a process so that I was able to, um, you know, run everything from Spain while having all my projects in South Florida. So she was um, a a huge, huge asset to my business um, and really helped me develop a luxury experience. You know, we were sending client gifts at onboarding um, during the presentation while they're waiting for furniture at their install and at the conclusion of the project. And I I think her developing, helping me develop um, these processes and and make my clients realize that this is a luxury service and just having that process to back it up was, was huge for me. I love it. I love it. That's so great. Katie is phenomenal. She really is. And I just think, you know, to your point, there are so many guests and consultants and and businesses that have come on the show that when you do avail yourself of them, you really do change. And it's, it goes to the thing about, you know, somebody else out there knows how to do it. And whether you're the smartest kid in the class or the one that is the most challenged with the content, why do you need to invent the wheel yourself? Like why, right? Like, you know, you can figure it out the long way or you can hire and work with somebody. It's, it's the same concept of design, right? Somebody with great taste can figure out how to make a room look good, or they can hire a designer and they can be sure it's going to look good, you know, probably at a better ultimate investment level because you don't spend the time on the mistakes. And it's the same with our businesses, right? Yeah, absolutely. And again, I, I think I, I do have to thank my parents. So much of that does come from, you know, our, our academic background where I'm just, I'm always a student. There's so mm. many opportunities to learn. There's so many professionals out there 
who have, like you said, already invented the wheel. There's no need for for you to reinvent it. Um, so I, again, I've literally hired so many of your guests. Um, I've taken <laughs> Rochelle Platt's upholstery course. Oh, that's um, so good, right? That that's great because because so many of my clients are athletes. They're really tall. Um, and her class made me an expert at upholstery construction. So I take everyone. You know, when I have a professional basketball player, let's say, and I'm just designing their home, I'm looking at their height and that's, I'm using what I learned from Rochelle's course to finding the perfect dimensions of a custom sofa for them. So there's just so many resources out there um, where you can learn so much. That's awesome. Yeah, that's her class at Lou University. And basically, it does. She teaches you how to all the questions, all the things that you have to figure out in order to design the piece of furniture that is ideal for your particular client. It's so funny because I remember the first time she told me about this knowledge that she had, that she was able to quantify and put it in a class for Lu Yu. And the thing was, the line that hit me, the line that hit me was, okay, so first of all, the line hits you is how to, you know, sell furniture to a client without a sit test. That line hits you. That, that, that's, a, that's a, you know, okay, sign me up line. But when she explained the secondary part of it, that's when I was like, oh, whoa, you're onto something. Because she said to me, she goes, Luann, yes, first of all, we are right to always encourage interior designers, all of us, are right to encourage interior designers to go to High Point Market. She goes, for all the reasons, for meeting the vendors and for in cementing the relationships and to see the styles and to touch the different things. And she said, and quote unquote, yes, to sit test. She said, but what am I? I'm five foot. You know, she didn't say this, but I'm going to tell you, she's like five foot and, and weighs nothing. Know, she's, she's the she's tiniest, tiny little petite thing. little thing, right? She is. So if she's 100 pounds soaking wet, it's probably 10 pounds heavier than she really is, right? So she says, what is the point of me doing a sit test in high point if I'm going to go back and work with a client that's six foot two and 240 pounds? Like, what's the value of that sit test? And my mind was blown. I was like, whoa, you are so right. And so, uh, so I'm so glad. Now, here you are, the proof of the pudding of it, right? Here you are. You've got to design and specify and um, re- resource furniture for clients that are not only in Florida, but that are unusual humans. They are right. not your garden variety size human, right? Yep. And Rochelle, another thing she says that's so interesting, too, is when you're changing the fabric of that sofa, mm. that's fantastic that you sat in it. It's going to feel completely <laughs> different based on the fabric that you chose. So right. again, I think sit tests are important, but what's more important is understanding how uh, each sofa, each sectional is constructed and the yes. framework behind it, the cushions, the fabric, how those all play a factor, I think is even more important than the sit yeah. test. So again, yeah. there's Her just so many resources. It, oh, I mean, it, Totally. T- Two piece, one piece of furniture that you sell that the the client is dead in love with is worth the the thing right there. So. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. She's wonderful, and I, yeah. there's also I'm in every possible Facebook group for designers. I mean, I'm in your group, <laughs> Veronica's, Cheryl's, Aww. Nancy, Claire, and I just sit and read all the time. I'm reading these comments, and even if it doesn't apply to me right now, it it very well could down the road. So I just sift through the comments and I learn and I learn. And I think that has helped me a ton. I mean, this community, I I don't think I expected um, everyone to be so helpful and Mm. it's great. I mean, the, just the resources that are out there for someone who may not have gone to design school, even if you went to design school, you know, there's, Facebook groups that help you more with the business side of it. So yeah. there's just so much to learn. And I, your podcast alone, I, I give so much credit to you and your podcast for my success, because really, I mean, I, I would be having a tough day and I'd put on your podcast and just feel like this rejuvenation and I'd mm-hmm. feel inspired to like, wow, let me, you know, whoever your guest is, they just always uh, leave me feeling excited about my business and um, just give me that extra little oomph to go out there for the day. And what can I do, you know, to, to grow my business today? So, That's awesome. so, so really your podcast um, 
it just is so unbelievable that I'm sitting here talking to you today just because <laughs> for I guess five five years now I've been I've been a listener of your podcast and um you have such a gift for interviewing people. And I mean, I, I listen to so many podcasts, design mm-hmm. and otherwise, and you just have such a gift um, as an interviewer to always ask the right questions and to pull so much out of your guests. So really, I attribute a ton, a ton of my success to you. So thank you. No, oh, sweetie, thank you. I appreciate that. You, you know, it's we doing it together. That's what it is. We're doing it together. If I, you know, I can ask all the right questions in the world, but if we don't have the people coming in every single week, putting their hand up saying, I'd love to share what I've learned, then where are we getting the answers from? So I appreciate that you see the value in it, but I know it's all of us doing it together. So I have a final question that I'd love to just get your perspective on. Um, and if you ultimately, say, no, I don't want to answer it, but I'm just so curious, your family, your mom, your dad, you know, they're, where are they at looking at, you know, everything that you've been through and uh, how you've come through it and to end up and to have created this lifestyle, like you said at one point in this interview, that it is possible and you should design a business that is in alignment with your view and of, of the way you want to live your life. So I'm curious, where where are they at with all of what you've done? Yeah, I, I like I said, I, t- the world today is so different from the world that you know I was born into in terms of just how much the internet has changed things. And again, if you have a skill set nowadays, I just think there's always a way to monetize it and to make a living off of it. So I think my parents understand that now too. And it's, it's so funny looking at, you know, my brothers and I, my, one of my brothers is in finance, the other is an attorney. And I mean, to be frank, I'm the only one of the three of us that loves their job. And I, <laughs> you know, they, they do super There's well. That. Yeah. They're so <laughs> successful. They do really, really well, but I think they would agree that they don't love what they do. So I think there's value in chasing um, a dream, even if it doesn't feel plausible. And I think as a parent now, I'm really, I really stress with my kids. I I mean, they're still so young, but it's going to be important for me to let them follow, follow their own lead and let them take the lead of their life and look and see what they're good at and just try to, you know, encourage them to follow what their own special skill set is. I mean, my brothers and I are so different. So to put us all in one box and think, let's, Mm -hmm. you guys all need to be doing this. And, you know, my three kids, even though they're so young, I can see are so different. So I'm going (laughs) to be um, really try to nurture whatever their individual skill sets mm. are and try to push them into following whatever it is that they love, because I think that's how I know that's how they'll be happiest down the road. So I never yeah. want my kids to feel like I'm, you know, pushing them into one career path. So many people say, oh, boys, great, a basketball players. And I'm like, <laughs> hold up, like they don't have to be basketball players. They'll go to 5 million basketball games in their lifetime, but they do not have to be basketball players. So right. I think we're, my husband and I are both really conscious about that, about letting our kids lead the way and with their own, you know, whatever they want to do rather than what we want for them. Mm. I, I, I'm a hundred percent in favor of everything you just said. I really truly am. And like my kids, if they're listening now, they're like, and here it comes the butt. Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to say that, and I said it a little bit before, but I'm just going to re say it here is I am McCall. I am very much in favor of what you're talking about, seeing the unique gifts of each of your children. I'm going to summarize what I heard, seeing the unique gifts, seeing the unique personalities, seeing the unique desires of each child. I definitely agree with you and I can see why that will be important to you and why you will do that. I also just have, for the record, I have to say that 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 we have our kids went through the rigors of you know 
D1 schools, right? So whether, you know, and of big colleges, right? And, you know, Bethany went through Seton Hall. Uh, Christy went through Georgetown. Mark, my goodness, Mark has five degrees. I can't even list all the darn degrees, okay? Um, the thing about it is, is watching them each achieve in those areas, like having that importance of, I, you know, like not, not any grade, but a good grade, not any grade, but the best grade I can get. Right. And then I know that it taught more than the result of that accounting class or that economics class. It taught that resilience that I see in you. You can get it in a, a million different ways. You could be a kid that grows up in your parents' business, sweeping the floors to all the way, you know, you know, setting up the shop. But I'm just saying in you, I really believe that you each week saying, hey, I want to be an actress. Okay, I'm going to have to study political science. Hey, I want to be a creative. Okay, I have to think about law. I think that is the root of that resilience where you're like, hey, sure wish I was in a country where I could speak to the doctor delivering my baby. But guess what? I'm not. So I'll just get it done. Right? Like, I mean, I just can't escape that. Yes. That vision of you digging hard on something that wasn't what you wanted to do. Not that you would knowingly make any of your children do that, but looking back the hindsight, isn't that part of that huge reason that you were able to do these crazy things that the rest of us can't even imagine? Oh, absolutely. And like I said before, it's it made me a student in, in the fact that I'm always learning. And that has helped yeah. me more in my business, you know, than than I can even tell you. But mm -hmm. you're so right. There's value in telling your kids to study and do well in school. I'm not here to say, oh, no, yeah, no, don't worry not. about school. Go, no, you know, know paint that. and don't go to class. <laughs> like, there's value in that. There's value in setting your mind to you know, I wanted to get, you know, a certain SAT score to be able to get that academic ride to college that I got. And there's value in setting goals and studying yeah. and preparing. Absolutely. That will translate in the business world and your personal life everywhere. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful that my parents did raise us, um, you know, with such high academic standards and it definitely helped me down the road. I think there's a happy medium too. Of mm, 100%. Let's, yeah. Let's be sure to, you know, have our kids study for school, take school seriously, do well, set goals. And let's also say, you know, if, if you want to be X, Y, Z, then let's be that. But l let's also make sure we are focusing on school, focusing on academics and, and doing well there as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe me. Yeah, we we're of like minds. I, yeah. I I'm not overstating it. I know darn well that there is a point where it's overbearing, where you you know, in a different environment, a different parent, a different child, you know, and your sentiment is loud and clear heard by me that we do want to see each of our children for the individual that they are and try and find that spark and nurture it. So right. it's we're we're good, but I just uh I I <laughs> it's just remarkable. So um, I'm really thrilled for you. I'm really, really thrilled for you. You have a heck of a business on your hands. Um, still doing it with three kids now under five is just beyond, let alone your, so you're in Sacramento, California now. Yeah. Have you, is your business still primarily in South Florida or you kind of set up shop in Sacramento? So it is. My my husband eventually retired um, from playing and is now coaching. He's coaching here for the Sacramento Kings. And I would say still the majority of my business is in South Florida. I do <laughs> have um, these athletes that are kind of scattered all over the country. But, you know, the, the business model that I've set up kind of allows me to help them no matter where they are. But yeah, we are yeah. in Sacramento right now. Um, but the, the vast majority of my clients are, are in the South Florida area. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's awesome. Well, I swear to goodness, it was so fun getting to know you, McCall. It really was. Um, I appreciate your sharing your journey because sometimes when we think, you know, we have a lot on our plate, I'm just like, okay, I don't have three kids under five and, you know, clients, you know, 4,000 miles away from me from like one end of the States to the other. That's crazy. Thank you so much for coming on the show and talking to us today. Thank you, Luann. Seriously, I, I'm just really so grateful for you and you do so much for our community and I, I couldn't be more grateful and just I'm so humbled to be on here and, and share a little bit of my story today. So I really appreciate you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. 
as you listen to McCall tell her story, were you trying to put yourself in her place? Were you trying to picture what it must have been like? I was. And the only thing I kept thinking was, whoa, (laughs) like, whoa, right? I can't fathom that, you know, her first pregnancy, postpartum depression, then you're having twins moving multiple times over all parts of the world, not having your family close, okay? And then ultimately giving birth to twins, that's a high-risk delivery in a hospital where people don't speak your language. Like, that's crazy. And then little icing for the cake. Let's have a little pandemic for you, (laughs) okay? I use the word resilience. I'm right, right? You agree. From the outside, the thing is, we think other people are living the dream, right? We have no idea what people are going through. And it's very, very rare that someone's life is just picture perfect. Okay. And I love that when McCall realized, you know, she came out of the postpartum depression and she was able to look hindsight and say, oh, okay, that wasn't normal. All right. This is so often the case and it shouldn't be this way. It's very hard for the woman to feel it, to know it, what's happening. I learned this with my daughter, Christy after the fact. So I urge you, if you have women in your life that are pregnant, pay attention to them. Pay attention to them during and after the pregnancy. Okay. Be that person that kind of looks out for them too. Okay. Now, how did McCall deal with this? She felt that she had to control something. I guess, I don't think she thought she could control three kids in a pandemic, right? But she felt she wanted to have some control. So she said she poured it into her business. It gave her an identity outside of, in addition to her identity as a mother and a wife. Okay. And then think about this, running a design firm, opening, starting a design firm. You've done it. You know how hard it is. It's hard enough. But here she does, she, it's based in South Florida and she's in Barcelona, <laughs> okay? It's, but it's living proof. She is living proof. It's living proof that if you have a business plan and if you run it like a business, then it can be done, okay? And it's also what McCall points out is that the business can look the way you want it to look as long as you do plan it and put it to process and system, okay? Now, um, I love that a factor of McCall's success was her Erica Ward transferable skills, right? She did defy the common narrative of her parents for her to be a lawyer, an academic or something. She had the creative bug, but that, 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 that other stuff is in her, right? Those skills that she learned are in her and she brings them to running her business, just like Erica Ward counseled us all the way back in the first, I don't know, when was she on the first half dozen shows or so? Bring the things you know from other experiences into your business, okay? And McCall is grateful for the standards that her parents had for her because from that, she has learned a couple of things. She's learned, number one, how she will personally support her children as they grow and mature, right? How she wants to, you know, make it her own and the way she views what support looks like. I love it. I love all of it. I love that McCall invested in herself and her business from the beginning and utilized the vital resources that we have here. Listening to this podcast, free, easy to do. Moving on to hiring Katie McFarland to, to help her develop a solid process, to taking Rochelle Plett's course at Luann University, how to sell upholstery without a sit test, okay? All the way to her connecting within uh, the Facebook groups, the interior design Facebook groups, and cultivating her support team and her information. Like she said, she scrolls the posts looking for the things that she didn't know she didn't know, right? So awesome job, McCall. I am really very honored and touched that you have gotten so much out of the podcast over listening these last several years. And I'm so glad that we met because of it and that we got to hear your story. Such an inspiration. Okay. And before I go, I do want to suggest that if any of these topics with postpartum depression or just being a young mother and having kids and just struggling to find that identity, you know, on my daughter's podcast, Sass Says, 
This is what she talks about over there. She's in that same stage of life, okay? It's a great resource if you are interested in conversations about mental health and about making it okay to talk about it and to say, I am experiencing whatever it is, okay? So please check it out, Sass Says, all right? Thank you tons for joining me. I do appreciate you so much. <laughs> Decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. Have an excellent day.